you have unlocked the podcast configuration <laughs> with America's most puzzling podcast, The Pod People. I'm the chatterer, Matisse Van Rossum. In the criminal justice system, <laughs> sensation-based offenses are considered especially heinous. In New York City, the dedicated creatures who investigate these vicious configurations are members of an elite squad called the Sensations Victims Unit. These are their stories. <laughs> And I'm Ben Sheets. Hey! <laughs> All right. Well, how the fuck am I supposed to follow that up? Um, I'm I'm pretty lispent configuration, uh, Cleveland Mosier. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm just I'm just jealous. <laughs> of what? How how drunk you are? I'm not that drunk. Yeah. Why? Well, I know. I'm just quoting the movie. Oh, yeah. I, I forgot about that already. <laughs> oh yeah, Jesus that was Christ. Yeah, Bur- buried in so much bad dialogue. So, well, that, I think that's the worst, though, right? Just, just diving in. You've got characters. Hellraiser. Are, Hellraiser. The new one. The new one. Diving in. You've got characters that are like screaming at each other, and you know, if you're gonna be having characters screaming at each other in your movie, you need to like give me something for that there needs to be build up there needs to be it, it needs to be a payoff or something you can't just have your characters screaming at each other the dialogue needs to mean something but on top of that they're screaming the dumbest shit this is characters screaming at each other the movie it is mm-hmm. all the dialogue at is least screamed. the first hour yeah. yeah yeah i well i mean it, it it permeates well into the second as well it does there's but, just thankfully more to, more interesting yeah. stuff in that second more hour. Like you've got, you've got more the, more more sights to to show us this person is like like an alcohol addict or whatever. Like they're an alcoholic. <laughs> an alcohol addict. They're they're an alcoholic or whatever. And like, well, it's it's they're because they're a sex addict. They're 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 a pill addict. They're a little little bit of everything. They're in they're in the twelve step program. We don't really know program. for what, but yeah. Assumably, they're sober. They're trying to be sober. They go off. They get drunk. They come back. The brother's questioning them. And man, we're really jumping she's right like, in. You're jealous, and he's like, "What is it? What is it?" He's, he he, he accuses drunk? her of he accuses her of being drunk of coming home drunk. You're drunk, and, she's, and she says, jealous? and she says, yeah. So what? Are you jealous? So what? Are you jealous? <laughs> like, yeah. no. It's the middle of the night. It's not that hard to get drunk. If I was jealous, I could also be drunk right now. Yeah, it's, <laughs> like, not, it's hard. not. Like it's the... he's holding down a draw job. He can like go get booze. Yeah, what the fuck? It's so weird. It's it's such a weird bit of dialogue. Also, spoiler alert. I'm really drunk. Going into you the jealous? Podcast. I'm Are jealous. You jealous. Oh, listen. I'm jealous. Is that that'd be a, that'd be a dumb way to feel about about someone you're listening to or one of your friends getting drunk? Are That's you really drunk? Are you really high? You've had like one. You've had like one seltzer. I've had I've had four. And when did uh, you have four <laughs> seltzers? When did that happen? The movie. I kept going back. I've been with you the whole time. When I did not see you go back. I've only had three seltzers. When did Sly, he pass me? Sneaky dog. <laughs> What's I'm going on? Boy. I'm a sneaky boy, and I'm also yeah. I also had an edible. The drunk configuration. Yeah, and, <laughs> yeah. There's a little lament in there for sure. Uh, coming on, coming onto the podcast to like talk in a in a public setting in a public forum. Yeah, and well, mackered. Should we intro the movie? This is a sloppy one, yeah. Yeah, that's my fault <laughs> it's, entirely. I'll, it's, I'll, I'll take the blame. Uh, we're talking about the new Hellraiser movie, the one that... Uh, we're, we're a little behind on this one. This came out several weeks ago, about a month ago at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, this is the Hulu-produced reboot of the Hellraiser franchise, directed by uh, David Bruckner, who uh, directed The Night House, which was one of our favorite films from last year. Also directed the ritual, which we talked about several years ago. Um, we, we generally like David Bruckner. Yeah, it's written by the same guys who wrote the Night House, as which well. is surprising, um, frankly. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll get into that. But yeah. uh, produced by our boy David S. Goyer. Yes. Uh, screen story. Screen story. By, the we were I, joking. During the ideas the movie man. That he is very much an ideas guy, and the fact that he was he was the, the ideas, ideas guy. guy well, it's, it's actually kind of surprising, because we were talking on Hulu, it said written by David S. Goyer, and we were like, wait a second. It was like, okay, well, I mean, he's an ideas man, the dialogue is not great, and then we get to the end credits, like, oh, it's just 
screenplay by David S. Goyer, and then the Nighthouse guys wrote the actual script, which is surprising because this script is much worse than the Nighthouse. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) I'm thinking back and comparing the dialogue of the Nighthouse in my head to some of this stuff and it's, it's like just night and day the night house and day. day yeah night house and day mm-hmm. house um <laughs> <laughs> the the no, i mean the the night house doesn't have like transcendent dialogue or anything like it's it's not it's not it does like have good characters and it is like, it, it is good, good is good characters and you know, it's a good it's a it good, good story dialogue. like like some of the bits about like her grieving husband where like she um and, and like how that that plays into like the the subtlety of her talking to her friends at the bar and all of that stuff. And like when she just kind of says like, you know, come out and say it. Yeah. Like all that stuff. I, I thought, I thought her character and her dial and that I thought the dialogue really helped make her. Yeah. yeah, That's 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 fair. I think it is. Like I thought it was really good. In the night house, it's a lot of her by herself. There's not as much dialogue. This is true. Yeah. I think this movie, this movie is fucking chock full of dialogue. Chock full of dialogue and useless characters. I you know I I think this this movie is is pretty like starkly divided to when there are cenobites on screen and when there are not, not cenobites on screen and they're very different movies like I all the cenobite stuff awesome Love fantastic it. 10 out of 10. in every regard yeah. like really really good even the dialogue and then it's like whenever the cenobites are not on screen which is most of the movie which is most of the movie it's like abysmal it's yeah. just so it's, boring it's, really it's just good. it's just characters yelling at each other about nothing really this movie's two fucking hours long, and there's easily thirty to forty minutes that could just be yeah. cut right out. I yeah. and it was weird too, because like going in, I was already excited, but going in, I really liked how they set up all the characters. You know, because the the movie starts with at, well after the title sequence, you know, where the the guy gets killed in the mansion. Yeah. Um. There we go. Guy gets killed in the mansion. We 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 get to the title sequence. We have two characters screwing. And it's great because you hear the sounds of them, like, getting at it, like, over the Hellraiser font, you know, at the top, which... Didn't the, you law and order the Law and Order font. The Law and Order font. Yeah. The glowing red on the black background. It, it, yeah, it feels really yeah, Law and Order. it's uncanny. It's like um, a serif font and everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but I do, I do like that you hear these two characters, like, you know, going after it. And um, it's like, oh, is it sounds of pain? Because you have the guy screaming and that becomes... Yeah, it blends into... Pleasure. Yeah. It's an audio thing. I think that's really fucking clever. I think that's really neat. And uh, we we get into that. The characters finish. I don't know if it's. I don't know then, if I would really say it's clever. They've been doing that since literally the first Hellraiser yeah. movie. Well, it's, it's neat. <laughs> They've been least. doing it for yeah. forty years. It's fun, but you know? sure. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and and so then the they, they they finish up and they walk into the apartment and they see or they walk out of their room into the rest of the apartment and they say, "Oh shit! All the roommates are back and they're cooking." Which how did how did they not hear that? Like they have the food basically ready. Like cooking is loud, um, but anyway, they, I mean, they not did. as loud as sex. Yeah, they mm. also said they did hear them. Well, the roommates who were cooking said they heard them having yeah. sex, yeah. but not but the not the other way around. The, yeah, because like that's why you make enough noise to make your presence known. It's kind of where they like tip do the, the roommates like tiptoeing around them banging because mm, it's a, mm-mm. just quietly. Yeah, no, eggs. don't. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's weird. You know, you need to like make sure that you know everyone's aware that everyone's there. But anyway, they finish up and they come out and they're like, "Oh, you heard us, didn't you?" And I I liked how they made that open. It was really awkward, and it's kind of a ballsy way to like introduce your characters. This like kind of awkward dynamic where it's like, "Oh yeah, like my roommates and my like gay brother heard heard you know me going at it." That's not what I wanted. Like no one no one's happy about that. Like and it and it shows that she's already kind of in an awkward position because we know that she's not paying her rent. We know that later on too. It's a cool way to kind of introduce that that she's from the beginning she's not really welcome there. Yeah, that, she's she's house. living with her brother. She's a crusty ex addict who is in recovery, uh, and she has the the dude that she's brought home is somebody that she met in the twelve step program, which the brother already does not feel good about because. Uh, you know, you shouldn't be sleeping with somebody who is in the same recovery program as you. So, yes, she she feels she feels unwelcome. 
Yeah, and which... and they spend a lot of time yelling at each other. Boy, do they sure spend a lot of time fighting and yelling. Boy, is there a lot of that in this movie? <laughs> and I don't know why. Yeah, like a little bit is is fine to some degree. Like at least like having them. I mean, it's it's a trope, right? You have the characters get in a bit of a shouting match, and then the one of the siblings is spirited away, and now the si- other sibling feels bad about it. You know, it's like, right. oh, the last thing we had was a fight. The problem is that, that their only interaction was fighting, right? Like, normally when a movie does that, like, you have, like, a kind of a sweet moment. You're, like, the viewer is shown, like, hey, they're a good person. They're not worth being spirited away. They have a little tiff, and then it's the last thing that happens to that character. So that character really needs to go and hunt, you know, like, save them. Well, I, I think they attempted that, you know, because he finds her in the park... He does you know, go after her and yeah. tries to he does feel bad help that her because he, you know, presumes that she is like near OD because she's passed out in the park. Yeah, and we and... did we did see that she took some pills that she found in her car, which yeah. first of all I don't buy because no drug addict has ever forgotten that they have more drugs. Well, it's funny <laughs> because she pours them out on the ground. To get rid of them and then picks them and up. And then picks them right back up. To give them the a ground. little more extra zest. Yeah, right. You know? Yeah. I, I think they tried for that redeeming element. It mm. just was overshadowed by how much argument. Mm-hmm. The argument went on so long. Yeah. Like, too long. Like, after a while, you're just kind of stewing in these two characters shouting at each other. And it's like, it's not. I could have ended way sooner. There's so it's much in this movie that could just that could just not be in it yeah, at all. Like the dialogue is yeah. really overwrought. Like it really it picks up in a major way in in the second hour, but it's like by the time it gets to that point, I'm like, why have I been sitting in this shit all along? Mm-hmm. And you know, now you might say like, okay, well, you know, the Cenobites are only in like three minutes of the original Hellraiser, you know? There's there's barely any Cenobite action in that movie. Yes, but <laughs> our main character is But you've got compelling. the whole you've got the the whole story of Uncle Frank yep. c- literally crawling his way back as a wet skeleton from hell and then the evil stepmother luring men home so he can suck out their life juices and wear their skin. Like You've actually got a compelling story going on in the midst of all of this. And so when the Cenobites show up at the beginning and the end, it's just a nice little treat. Nice little bit of, nice little yeah, flavor well, of Cenobites. I, I think that's the big problem. I think the through line of this film isn't compelling enough. It's to boring. That. <laughs> and there's only you know, one like, story. It's being boring told. as shit. Yeah, I, I think. They had elements of really interesting stuff in there, you know? Yeah. The the rich billionaire who is, you know, just desperately seeking. He should have been a lot more of a B plot. The whole movie movie should have been about him. Or or at least he should have been in the movie as much as the uncle is in the original. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes. The whole movie. That should have been the central plot of the movie is him coming into possession of the puzzle box and we should see him his his uh his misdeeds and his exploits working it through its various configurations into the final form that will allow him to have the audience with leviathan that should have been the whole fucking movie see and that's the thing on a conceptual level like the major plot points of this film work, you know, having her trying to figure out who he is and what he's about, you know, kind of going back to the mansion, trying to discover all this stuff, and him kind of pulling the strings in the background, it works. (laughs) The problem is they don't reveal the twist of him being the one pulling the strings until, like, the third act. Yeah. And because it waits so long in a two-hour movie... We don't get enough of that. Yeah. I think, honestly, if they would have had that reveal, like, a little before halfway through and kind of shown him kind of influencing things a bit more, it would have been much more interesting. Yeah, we saw, we we checked the time about when she finally, our protagonist finally goes to the mansion 
and it was 50 minutes into the movie, five zero. It should have been 15 minutes into the movie. Or 30. I think or, 30 would have been fine. Yeah, 20, yeah, between between 15 and 30, sometime in there is when she should have gotten to the mansion. Because yeah. it's like, Jesus fucking Christ, everything before that is so interminably boring. And the problem is, once they get to the mansion, that twist isn't even revealed until... For like, another 20 minutes. Yeah, 20 yeah. minutes later. So, I, I think they should have just kind of... Honestly, with a Hellraiser movie, story-wise, less is more, to yes. be honest. Like, 100%. Make it a showcase of cool Cenobites. Yes. Like, the, the, sim- the simplicity of the core story of the original Hellraiser is one of its greatest strengths. Man and his wife and his daughter moves into a house that was owned by his brother, who has disappeared. Brother shows back up coming back from some horrible pain dimension, (laughs) starts banging the stepmom. She brings men home for him to slurp up and regain his skin while daughter tries to figure out what's going on and save herself and her father. Like, that is so fucking simple and clean. And most of the movie takes place in that one central location of the house this movie would have benefited from that greatly. I think the 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 rich guy's mansion Incredible once we're there set. is it's, a cool set. It's so cool. We see that at. he's built like this elaborate kind of cage around the entire house mm-hmm. that is sort of like a similar pattern that you see like on the the puzzle box. Like that's all really cool. He's got like a weird sex dungeon. Like this setting is great. Get us there way fucking sooner and have that be the central location of the film. On top of that, I I want to bring up a narrative point that kind of adds to the complexity of this movie. Almost the element of being convoluted mm. um, is all the different configurations of the box. Forgive me if I don't remember, but that mm. was not part of the original no. Correct. two movies. Is that part of the short story? No, or, no. no, that was something completely. This is original. that is a. I mean, I've I've only seen <laughs> of the original Hellraiser series. I've only seen up through six, so I can't. I can't say that they don't introduce something like that in one of the way later ones. No, I'm I, I'm I'm lifting my hand from the back of the class. Uh. Uh, yeah, I, I've only seen four, but I have I've read the Hellbound Heart, and I've also read Scarlet Gospels. And in neither of those is there anything like that. I no, definitely not in the Hellbound Heart. I haven't read Scarlet I mean, Gospels. Not but... that that really matters to me because like Clyde Barker did produce, you know. And, sure. and again, I don't know to what capacity, but like, I mean, honestly, he probably just got a producer's credit because it's his story. Yeah, but I mean, and based on his character. Yeah, I, I get the, I get the vibe that I. Yeah, like he. I mean, I. I think that's an element. On it, the least, different you know? configurations and the different impacts and oh, meanings dude. each have is an interesting concept yeah. on paper. I think the problem is it's difficult to clearly express that visually. So the movie has to pause and tell us directly yeah. what is each configuration yeah she finds a journal that lists them out she finds the exposition journal yeah it's literally a journal full of just exposition i mean i mean that's that's not out of the ordinary for these type of horror movies he would have it i can forgive it yeah and also it looked really cool at least like i really liked the art in that. but i agree with you it does sort of in a movie that's already too long it does sort of feel like needlessly convoluted to, to sort of expand on the idea to or to explain the idea is that the the puzzle box has six different configurations. What we know is the lament configuration, which is the classic Hellraiser puzzle box. The cube. the cube is only the first configuration of this puzzle box and 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 each configuration requires a sacrifice. And it goes through all of these different shapes that each represent something. Pinhead lists them at the end. They all start with the letter L. I don't remember most of them. Lament is obviously the first one. There's liminal. 
uh, Lazarus and Levi and Leviathan. Leviticus. I could honestly not give a shit. Yeah, they, it doesn't. It does not fucking matter. Yeah. It does not fucking matter. But the idea is that each configuration represents a different uh, prize. You can ask. <laughs> you can ask from Leviathan once you reach the final configuration and get to have your audience with God. Is that you can ask for a boon or a gift that relates to one of the one of the configurations. So the main character realizes that one of the the, the Lazarus configuration is resurrection. So if she gets it to the end, she can ask for her brother to uh, be brought back to life. But oh, what is she going to do? She's got to sacrifice like that each configuration requires a sacrifice. And like when that was first explained, I was kind of like Okay, so here's the the chance for her to have her little dark side turn, you know, yeah. for her yeah. to start sacrificing her friends to try to get her brother back, right? So she's not just like a good, pure character, like she's got the evil, you know, in her. And then they, they don't, they don't do that. They chicken out. She's... I, was, I was so bummed because like there's a lot of sequences where she and Pinhead are, are kind of having a bit of a dialogue moment and pinhead seems to almost admire her you know like like there is sort of a thing like oh yeah we're not coming for you yet because you're special you're gonna be like us and like pinhead is almost like giving them a chance because pinhead wants them to did you get that impression too like am i i don't know i i, I felt hard, like yeah it's hard like, to say yeah like there's there's maybe like there's a chance which i like because in the original like the cenobites kind of get her wrong at first, too, you know, like they think, like, oh yeah, no, you opened the box, we came, bitch, like here we go, and she's like, well, no, actually, I didn't, I just, you know, uh, wrong place, wrong time, you know, and here it it feels like, oh, maybe they're kind of doing something different with that, where she seems to be wrong place, wrong time, but really she kind of does want to be there, and well, but and they, they played up with like the sex at the beginning of the the movie, like that that sense of addiction, like oh yeah, maybe she really wants this, and yeah, they they chicken out they then they don't they don't really follow through on that she just is yeah good. it's th that that brings up an interesting point too is that the the cenobites feel like much more of an active threat in this movie in mm. a way that i'm not quite sure i i like i don't i don't outright dislike it but one of the cool things about especially the original hellraiser is that it doesn't feel like the Cenobites particularly have an agenda. It's like there's this box. If you solve it, it's like, oh, shit, you open the door. You called us and we're here, so we're going to take something while we're here. But, you know, it doesn't feel like they're actively, like, trying to influence events. Yeah. And in this movie, there's very much that, like, push, that nudging from them being like, we want you to solve the box. You're, you know, we're going to, you got to sacrifice more people to get to the very end so you can have your audience with Leviathan and ask for one of our gifts. You know, it's like, oh, you got to do this. Like they're, they're like pushing her. And I don't know how I feel about that. I kind of, I kind of like the idea of the Cenobites as like so disconnected from the human world that it's like, well, you rang the doorbell, so we're here, but we're just going to take you and go back to our nightmare realm of pain and pleasure yeah, where they, we're, where we're happy vibing and chilling, they, you know, they like see people is insignificant. Yes. And when a person gets through, it's almost a loophole, you know, like yeah. this cube isn't really supposed to exist. No, some, some asshole back in France in the 1700s built it because he was trying to like get into their realm. Yeah. It's not like something that they created or whatever, right? It's right. like some some asshole dicking around and opened a door into their world. And they're like, well, okay, you opened the door, so we're going to take our pound of flesh. But we don't really have time for this, you know? Mm -hmm. It's different in Hellraiser 2 when they end up, like, in the Cenobites world, like, in the labyrinth. It's like, okay, you're in our home, so we're going to play around with you and have fun, right? Yeah. But still, it just feels like you wandered your way in here, so now you're gonna get, you're gonna reap the the the, the consequences of that. You their know? whole job as disciples, from what I remember, is like they're just they patrol the hell realm, you know, or the Leviathan dimension or whatever, 
and they torture people like in the afterlife or whatever yeah you know and it's like yeah like you and they just they torture that realm and that's their job they go around and they're they're like adjuncts of that and here instead it's like yeah they almost exist for the box the box is a lot more important but i will say if you're going to give the box more important in this adaptation of hellraiser they made the box look really fucking cool and i gotta give them it's cool i love all the different ways it moves and dials and shifts like because in the original like they just they move different parts of the cube and it's like essentially a really complex rubik's cube but here it's like it it takes all sorts of different shapes Mm -hmm. and and Mm -hmm. keeps shifting and i do love that its final shape is in the shape of the leviathan just like in uh in in hellraiser 2 2. yeah Yeah. and i i thought that was fucking rad i i thought that was neat um and also the idea of the box like actively like hurting you and and also uh, again on paper like you were saying i love the idea of taking the premise of hellraiser and boiling it down into a slasher on paper that means more hellraiser stuff but here it was and it was less somehow and that's what's so odd is like this film felt less hellraiser and it was like there's so much like drama people shouting at each other or whatever else but there were more kills like there were more like yeah the original but they're so they're so brief next to just all of the, the the shouting there's so much leading into all those kills it feels like the soul of hellraiser is kind of missing here like it has a lot of the the hallmarks of hellraiser but there's there's some absence that i can't quite put my finger on i think part of it is this movie's not horny enough yeah, like there's a couple with the sex yeah. scene and then there's a, there's a after. couple there's a couple of sex scenes but there's like there's like a the the first Hellraiser in particular. There's like a really perverse, like sweaty horniness yeah, to the I mean, whole thing. The uncle thing, is you know? such a degenerate. Like the uncle belonged in that realm, and the perversion yeah. isn't the uncle being trapped in that realm. The perversion is the uncle escaping that realm and coming back. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. He's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna take what I've learned and bring it to back to this dimension. And, and that's like, no, why you can't do that. And that's, that's why. The why is there at. not more of the of the like sleazy millionaire guy in this movie? Like yeah. he is. Like we see that he's got a weird sex dungeon. Like he tracked down this puzzle box to try to get to the Cenobites so he can, you know, experience their pleasures. He picked, right. Like, like he has like his. His servant like pick out a or his his butler lawyer, or whatever his lawyer, lawyer yeah, like, pick boss, out a person yeah. and like bring them into that room. See, <laughs> that's what I thought was so brilliant about the opening scene is they have this sort of eyes wide shut sort of like rich mansion party going on mm-hmm. where they play like a song that sounds like the succession theme like fancy piano classical piano with a trap beat under it yeah there's some dude getting a lap dance in the corner but honestly it looks kind of boring and that's it's the very interesting tame, yeah. thing about the party is it's like these points of pleasure and things like that are so every day and mundane for this rich billionaire yeah. that it becomes boring and I found that super interesting. And I think, like, yeah, that's that, it's that, those elements with the the billionaire and, like, him being so bored with kind of the debauchery and dark things that he does, that he seeks out extreme sensation, is awesome he should be a more central character he should be the frank of this movie and it's just like just having your typical horror movie gang of teenagers slash 20 somethings is so uninteresting for hellraiser well that's the that i think that's also kind of the problem of starting the film with that sequence because we see him lure in the the subject to you know the complete victim, the yeah. box um and then we see kind of what happens and him asking for whatever he does mm-hmm. at the opening and then we cut to these completely unrelated characters and don't get back to the billionaire until two thirds of the way through the movie and I think by setting our expectations with that opening for one thing and then 
doing something completely different and the the rest of the movie being the search and kind of adventure to back yeah. to that original um story it's not as interesting no nope. um and not i i think that's just a narrative issue with this movie i will say we we've been ragging on the narrative a lot i do want to emphasize that this film does have some strengths i oh, think totally. visually Many. this film is incredible this yeah. film you Damn know near Dave, everything i would want david bruckner yeah absolutely takes his strengths from things like the night house and the ritual and translates it super well to hellraiser i i think like the cenobites all look awesome fantastic the, yeah. the gore in this movie is amazing supreme I, we get multiple sequences of people either getting hung by chains or getting ripped apart by chains very much like the original mm-hmm. Hellraiser. But I think uh, there's a lot of creativity besides those. A lot of interesting things done with body horror. Um, and and I love I love the way that, like, when the Cenobites are called, like when a sacrifice is made, when somebody cuts themselves on the box and it changes configuration, the way that the Cenobites come into the world through like puzzle like shifting of the space around it reminded, them it reminded me a lot of the night house yeah you yeah, know, yeah in kind of taking our understanding of spatial awareness and flipping it on its head the my favorite sequence of that in this film was uh when they're in the van yes i was and, gonna bring that up uh, as well the british girl is in the back and she had been cut by the box and the uh, british girl whose only real personality trait is that she's british yeah <laughs> correct that's it that's yeah. what we get uh and she's looking out the back window laying down because she was cut and she's bleeding and uh it gets starts getting further and further away and she turns to look towards the front and the front of the van is getting further and further away until it becomes a long corridor yeah that she's stuck in and Man, oh man, that's just perfectly executed. That whole sequence is hands down the highlight of and the movie for I, me. I would say, like, that does get the soul of Hellraiser, right? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Like, and that's that's that moment there is how you translate like something with like modern yep, tech. Totally. Like, if you're gonna you're gonna take like everything they could have done in the '80s and do it now with this story again, that's what like you do. really, it's really great. all the Cenobite stuff. Like, is mo- they Kick they ass. modernize it so well? Like, it still feels very much like Hellraiser, but mm-hmm. it also feels really fresh and new. The design of all of the Cenobites is fucking exquisite. Mm-hmm. Well, the the most brilliant part of that quarter sequence is I think that was practical yeah it seems like it was practical with projectors yes yeah i was gonna say it's yeah it it there they have projectors on either side and they're mm-hmm. moving them down a hallway to yeah. elongate the yeah. space and yeah that's very much in the same Proje- projectors are a green screen and then it's probably projectors because uh the night house does a lot of uh practical effects with mm. the 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 room changing to the faces yeah that's a lot of like practical movement and in camera stuff i I would believe that this is also in camera stuff and i think overall this movie uh really shines on in terms of the practicals you know it'd be so easy to make this stuff just cg yes bullshit but like it feels very tactile because it's a lot of good practice all of this all of the cg is very tasteful it's like there's no doubt at times things are cg but it looks really good and it doesn't feel cheap uh and it it is used in the way that cg should be to enhance good practical effects but yeah the cenobites that's all makeup it all looks really good the sets are all like built they're not they're not just like green actors on green screens i have a question for y'all okay so the cenobites black eyes with the the colored the deant version mm-hmm. yeah yeah. Well, yeah 
what what is your thoughts on that? I love it. Yeah, I it's fun. I'm not sure how I feel about it because like on I'm a su- hand, I'm a sucker for black irises or not, for black eyes. Yeah, not all of them do. It's different per Cenobite. And I thought that was fun. Yeah. No, the the the, the Cenobites, their eyes are all the same. Yeah, their eyes all have that black. Black, it's it's full uh, it's full black with a with a very bright blue uh iris yeah mm-hmm. Every, all the cinnabites well, have the same so eyes pinhead is all black right no pinhead has the same oh do they? yeah oh, mm-hmm. okay i'm not sure how i feel about it because on one hand i think it looks cool on the other hand i think one of the interesting things about the original hellraiser is they have human eyes Pinhead has human eyes, and we we look at the eyes and say that's a human that's been fucked up, you know. And when the eyes are black, there's kind of a distancing effect there. Like all the Cenobites, I feel like don't feel as much like humans that were fucked up, and more like creatures in this movie. Really, I I, I thought that they they really did feel like. The like the flesh and the the designs on all of them and the costumes on all of them is so good that it really did feel like all of them had like peeled flesh. I well, see, sure, I, like the the literal flesh and like you know effects work and costuming was great, but I think like it's such a small detail. But looking into the eyes mm. of these creatures and seeing human eyes is such an interesting part of the original Cenobites. Yeah. Though I will say, with the original Cenobites, not all of them had eyes to begin with. Yeah. yeah. Pinhead was... Butterball, Butterball, Butterball has wearing, Morpheus He's wearing sunglasses. sunglasses. Yeah. 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 You know, and... I don't know. I, I think it's... I think it's just... I think it's just a difference. I don't think it's one is necessarily better than the other. But I do think this movie does a really good job of making the Cenobites feel really other, like really sure. in, really inhuman. And whether you think that's a positive or a negative, I think, depends on, on your perspective. I I personally like the, the otherness of the Cenobites in this movie, whereas, like, I... Don't get me wrong. I do love the OG Cenobites. I love how they look and I love their design, but they do just kind of look like like BDSM dudes in leather. You know, like yeah, it is yeah. they, they're BDSM demons. Yeah, they're they're, before, they're yeah, yeah. And, and it's cool and they're fun and I and I do and I do like them. But there is that kind of disconnect where it's like I don't know if I necessarily buy them as like otherworldly demons. True. Not entirely. Whereas these Cenobites, I do. These these Cenobites, they and I, I love how it's again. It's so weird because like I love how it's delivered in the Cenobite dialogue, which is all great. That they were once regular people who have just continued even after solving the box to seek higher thresholds, and like their whole deal is like thresholds of consciousness, thresholds of pain, thresholds of pleasure, thresholds of sensation. To the point where, like, you have the one character who has skinned their face, and they've just done so much with their head that there isn't even a head anymore. It's just the skin face in the front. I love that. Yeah, design. you can see through the eye holes just to, like, the whatever the wall behind them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, like, it's... So many fucking cool designs it's in It's really movie. well executed, like, yeah. special effects-wise, too. I love that character. And just the idea that, like, yeah, he's, like, grafted away his head so much that there's just no head anymore. Just a frame with a face on it with yeah. no head behind and it. Like, yeah. And it's cool. And I really like that Pinhead says, like, yeah, and after this threshold, you just keep seeking higher thresholds. That's the whole deal. And I guess you're not ready for that. And I thought that was cool. I, 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 thought, I thought, like, it makes so much sense and it kind of shows, like, how they got to that point. Um, is it, and it's the same way that the uncle in the original movie wants to get to that point. So, like, and again, in that respect, I think they did get the soul. I think they did get the point of, like, the original, like, like the real true heart of it. They they nailed it. And, of, and, of specifically, for, specifically of the Cenobite for aspect. For, like, 30 minutes of this two-hour movie. Well, that's for, the... Yeah. the Cen- they, they, nailed, they nailed the Cenobite aspect of the Hellraiser move, of, of the original Hellraiser. They... 
wildly whiff on everything else. On the human story, See, they totally well, that's whiff. The thing. That's yeah. the thing. I think it nails it in terms of the visual storytelling. It's the narrative storytelling mm -hmm. that's an issue. Yeah, which is um, as important to the original Hellraiser. Yeah, now. yeah, totally. And you know, once again, to 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 go back to something we were talking about before, this movie is heavy on pain, light on pleasure. pleasure. You know, and that's the, that's always the thing about the Cenobites is that is that they offer both. Yep. They offer pain and pleasure. They well, offer pleasure through pain. Like, here's, here's the thing, too. Like, in the original Cenobites design, there is an element of that, right? Like, Butterball is literally just gluttony, right? Sure. Like, so gl Butterball is, is just by design, whether we see it or not, enjoying other things, right? The, uh, the female Cenobite, which, again, I, I, do, I do think is weird and, and not very well written and for the original that she's just the female the cenobite. female cenobite but, yeah but let's be real what's her whole deal vagina neck she has a pussy neck right mm -hmm. again there's an implication there right like she is seeking sex like for for pleasure or whatnot right pinhead is seeking pain for pleasure chatter we don't even know what his deal is probably some really weird shit but like it, <laughs> Chat chatterer again like there's there was almost a comedic element to chatterer and, like, that is also... Yeah, because he just walk around chattering. Yeah, and, like, there there is something kind of, like, comedic about him. And, and like, that is, in its own way, scary, right? Because we don't... You can't even really tell what Chatterer is pursuing. And I, I like that. So, like, the point is... Um, Teeth. That, like, each of the Cenobites, like, just by visual design, for even though we only see them for a short amount of time... There's an implication there. All the, all the, le all the leather, leather too, you know? Right, all the leather. So, like... And this, this movie does away with the leather, and I, I, get, I get why they did, and I think it's probably the right decision for a, modern, a modernization, you know? Nah, leather, man, it makes it so much hornier. I, yes, I agree with you, but also, like, you just have to consider that, like, leather is, an 80, is like an 80s thing. Well, I will say. Like, leather is, not, leather is not, like, a fashion thing anymore. Leather is still a BDSM Sure. And that's part well, of it. Well, Ben, here, here's, here's my response to that. But these Cenobites are all naked. They, well, they're not just naked. They're using people leather. There is, like, a, a skinned and tanned element to, like, some of their, their flesh. They're just using the ultimate form of leather, and I think that's fucking great. Their own flesh. Yeah. yeah. Like, as their cut, garments. Cut into the shapes of, of garments, yeah, which I think is... That's the coolest yeah, fucking thing Yeah, I, I think it's do. cool. Yeah, I, I, I adore that. I dig it. Yeah, and while we're on the topic of the Cenobites design, and, like, I, I get it. Like, I would also love to see another Hellraiser movie where they did do the more of the leather, goofy leather stuff. I'm, I don't, I don't think, I don't think the it's leather, fun. I don't think leather the leather is, is necessary to make the movie horny. I agree that leather yes. is a medium for horniness and it yes. works and it works very well for the original Hellraiser yeah. and those Cenobites. I think that, and I don't. I don't think these I'm Cenobites need like, leather, but the movie does need to be yeah, horny. All I'm saying is, if you're not gonna actually put horny in your movie, yeah. signal horny. Yeah. You know, through they stuff need to signal like horny way harder. Yeah, and yeah. Stuff. And and like, I think they could have done that and taken it a little bit further too. Like one of, one of the key elements of Pinhead's original design is in there have been windows cut down his chest in the leather outfit where his nipples are flayed, and other sections as well, implying that maybe he's, like... Again, I, this is all implied. Maybe it's just, like, rows of flesh are stripped on his chest, but also, like, maybe he's, like, grown, like, a set of dog nipples, and he's, like, he's like ripped yeah. those off, too. And, like, he's just... He's on a whole other fucking plane. Visual storytelling, right? There. Right, yeah. exactly. There's so much implied. You don't know how much any of it is. It, it's, it's kind of horrifying, because you have to come to those conclusions on your own. It's fucking nasty. It's it's genius. I, I do like, I do think the Cenobites in this movie. I do think that the the their nudity captures a similar sor source of eroticism that the leather does, just different. Yeah. And 
again, the lack of horniness in the movie, I don't think the Cenobites are the problem with that. I really the don't. Yeah. It's I it's every it's everything else. At the same time, though. M- maybe, maybe maybe you maybe could. Maybe Cenobites give them boners. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. I I give like pussy necks. I like the I like <laughs> there's still pussy necks in this one. That's true. There's definitely yeah. still pussy necks and and orifices. But I do I do like that this movie seems to stick a little bit closer to the source material of the Hellbound Heart and making the Cenobites more androgynous and yeah, and, and genderless. Yes. Um, I know that that's, uh, of course, the thing that the, all the, the chuds online are angry about. We don't humor those kind of arguments here on this podcast about, shit, yeah. about how mad they are about trans pinhead Fuck, fuck out of here with yeah, that. Get, not, not worth humoring that <laughs> Whatever. argument. You know, like I mean, yeah, like the that's such a silly argument. And I gotta say too, that was to say I, that to say that the gays like, have the queers the, have stolen Hellraiser from Clive Barker, who is an op, an oh, who is an right. openly like, gay man and has been. Well, conceptually, <laughs> it makes sense in this movie. Yeah, like, they yes. should be androgynous. And, and right? yes, like, that and in in the Hellbound Heart, the Cenobites are. Sexless, genderless. They are androgynous. They, they are not to thresholds. They, that. Yes, they have ascended beyond gender. They yeah. are neither male nor female. Which, which rules? And and why I thought it was super cool that they and got, this movie this movie does that for all of the Cenobites. For not, all of them, yeah. not just not just Pinhead. They're all androgynous. That's why I think the the criticisms and complaints on that front are so stupid because yes. it's like. It's one thing if you make an empty gesture and just, gen, uh, you know, gender swap a character. It's another thing if it makes sense contextually. Sure, you know? yeah. And this one was very contextually done. This totally makes sense in context. Yeah, it does. And, uh, yeah, so for me, going into this movie uh, for months now, I've been really excited. Like, having read the book. Um, and, and also already being a big fan of Jamie Clayton. I love their work in sense I, I think that sense is the best thing that the Wachowskis have done easily, <laughs> like by miles, like to the point where I was baffled that this, the Wachowskis made it. Um, uh, and I, and I, and I like some of their other stuff too. Like, don't get me wrong. But the point is, is that I really like, uh, I really like, uh, them and their character on that. So I was like, oh, that's a great casting, but Doug Bradley has an iconic voice, and his delivery in Hellraiser is one of my favorite things about it. So, a little nervous as well, right? Like, big fan of, uh, I, I believe their name is Jamie Clayton. But yes, like, um, that's uh, correct. Good, good. So I'm, I'm just terrible with names in general, but like... Uh, no, Jamie Clayton is yeah, who plays Pinhead. In this. I, 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 I thought they were an awesome choice, but I was a little tentative going in. I thought their voice was fucking rad. I thought they sounded cool. Um, and it, and, and it doesn't sound anything like Doug Bradley, which is good. Like they didn't try to re-emulate that, but there's a, a really cool duality to their voice where like it, it's, they added like some mega bassy like effects and processing. The, vo- the vocal processing cool is sounding. good. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, Way cooler it's than the new jigsaw. It's as, it's as, In it's, spiral, like it's as androgynous that. as, oh, as man. their physical appearance as well. It's the voice is. The voice contains both the masculine and the feminine, feminine. and cool. and I think I think the, the the vocal processing is good. I will say I one thing that I I have a little bit of a problem with is I think at times it's hard to understand the Cenobites it's because to the humans too. The, yeah, I think it's I think it's harder to understand the Cenobites because there's heavy vocal processing on all of them, and they all you know speak very they softly and kind of sibilantly and you know it's kind of kind of almost mumbling a little bit and with the heavy like layering of the vocal processing the the enunciations get lost in there there were a few times where i wished we had turned on the subtitles for this whereas you compare it to like doug bradley who is like booming yeah. You know, you yeah. opened the box. We, we came. We have such sights to, to show you. You, you yeah. know, all base, only base. Right. <laughs> and, it's, and like, and very clear, like booming enunciation. Yeah, it's, it's, it's booming out across like this endless maze. It's the voice of the acolyte of the Leviathan, right? Like, it is the voice of this. The this, Hell Priest. This yeah. Hell Priest. And uh, I do. 
I, I do like the Quiet Hell Priest stuff. I just think I needed subtitles. Yeah. Like, I, I think... Mm-hmm. I, and it was, and it was less, it was less like pinheads. It was more the other one with like the, I guess the the new female version of the female Cenobite. Like they were a little bit more whispery, I guess. But yeah, I don't know. The the, the people shouting, I felt like I needed something. No, I, I, I thought I thought it was like the 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 voices were cool. But I, I, cool, I dug like, it overall. Like it was like serpent like. Like there was like a like a harshness to the way that that mm. uh, uh, Jamie Clayton like delivered their lines that I thought was super cool. I loved just, like, looking at those shots and just knowing it was, like, all real. Like, yeah. all of their makeup, all, like, their whole fucking suit is handmade. Incredible. Like, I... All of them. It's so cool that, like, in this year, we've gotten, like, a fully made Predator suit and fully made Cenobite suits. Like, yeah, Practical's and, back, baby. And they're, like, like, they're, like... Fuck yeah. They're, like, what, like, six or seven distinct Cenobites in this movie, too? Man. All with fully modeled and constructed, in the like, suits and makeup? In the mid-2000s, it never would have happened. Like, yeah. we would never have gotten a year where we would have gotten, like, a pra- another Practical Predator and Practical Cenobites. You know, you like, know how they... so fucking great. You know how they pulled, back, you know how I pulled it off? And this is not a, this is not a knock. They made the right decision. <laughs> they spent all their money on the Practical Effects and shot the movie cheap in Serbia. <laughs> <laughs> we we, we, saw, no, that, that we a, saw in the credits. That, that, yeah, I, I don't disagree yeah, with. They, I, that's, I think that's that's what seemed they like, did. it seemed they like spent, it paid off really well. They spent all of their money, they spent all their money on their makeup and Practical Effects <laughs> and cut and uh, cut corners by shooting cheap in serbia and honestly right decision right decision <laughs> absolutely yeah. um well i think the thing is like i just wish there was more of it like that's yes. the biggest bingo thing. one hundo if, if the movie was shorter even like it would feel like more of a percentage of the movie. There, was there really, there really is plenty of them yeah. in this in the second half, but that first hour is such a slog. Yeah, such a fucking. Don't just slog. wish this movie was ninety minutes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like, I think you know, with the Hellraiser movie, just be a showcase. Mm-hmm. Be a showcase for great practicals. And like, when it's so many good when ones it's doing that. that, when it is showcasing the practical effects, it's it's exquisite. So it's I, so good. I think I think something that's really important to note at this point because like we've we've had a lot of like critiques on the film and saying like how we might have preferred to see things or whatever. But honestly, like I think that there's a five out of five movie here if it had just been like edited tighter on the chopping block, like. If you just to get, down to get up to five stuff. to get up to five out of five, like the script needs some pretty heavy doctoring. But I I yeah. think I think there's I think there's probably like a four star movie in inside in inside this movie if, in, if the you, edit, in the I, edit. I, I would yeah. have been a lot less bothered by like the bad dialogue if the bad dialogue had been shorter and snappy. Yeah, and totally. Got to like you know like we just got into that stuff sooner, and the movie even if the movie edited sooner. Again, like I think a tight. This really is, like, there is a tight 90 movie in this without any reshoots or any, like, re... I think... Any, any re... Even bringing the actors back to, like, dub scenes over, like, I, I don't think that's necessary. I, I th- Well, I, I think for, like, a 4 out of 5. Like, you know, like, or a, or 4.5 out of 5. Like, you could, you could do, like, a really solid movie here. Not the best thing ever. Like, again, don't have the you're just jealous line. Like, cut that. Get it out. Like, get a few of those other things out, and, like, the other stuff would be pretty forgivable. Because, like, for any other movie, I don't I don't hate the premise of the characters on paper. The sister having her brother taken away. I, I thought it was really cool that she's not trying to save a lover or, like, it's not your standard, like, situation. Like, it's a platonic like love it you've got these other characters like the the whole roommate thing like if the characters have been more compelling and again like one of the roommates just wasn't just british and that's it like it would have been really nice to see more with that yeah, it, like, feels, it feels like kirsty it feels like kirsty trying kirsty trying to save her father in the original exactly yeah. and see, like that's great like she's trying to save her brother it's it's basically the labyrinth but you you have to like trim it down and you need to like give those characters just a few more positive moments with each other uh, I think if you made the through line more compelling, that's all that's really needed. Like, yeah. I think a huge comparison is the Nighthouse. Mm. Like, same director, same writers. Like, they take a story of 
slowly uncovering things and discovering things and they make it way more compelling yeah Yeah. like it's crazy that the same writing team and the same director made both of them because like essentially like for the first hour plus like it's a very similar structured movie in that it's this girl that's trying to discover what happened to her brother yeah and kind of uncover the mysteries of her lost person that she cares about like that's very similar to the night house the problem is like that isn't compelling in this film because like they really fumble the dialogue a and b kind of the the finer points and you know the the horror of it yeah there's very little horror in the first half of the movie to really to really compare the two like you're saying because structurally they are similar but the difference is that in this movie our protagonist has lost a family member because he cut himself on the scary box and got uh dragged into hell Whereas in the night house, she's trying to figure out what happened because she had a picture perfect, happy marriage with her husband who mysteriously one day woke up and killed himself for seemingly no reason. And trying to figure out why when we had such a picture perfect, beautiful, happy life together when we weren't fighting, when there wasn't turmoil, when everything was good, what caused this sudden horrifying event? A hundred percent. It's more of a mystery to the viewer. Yeah, exactly. There's no mystery here because we know We know the Cenobites got her brother. We saw it happen. I want to note on one thing you said, Ben. And that is, I don't understand how the same people who did the light, the, the night house, not the lighthouse, the night house could go and do this movie when the night has such, such good dialogue and so tight compared to this film. And I do see it in that, first of all, I agree in the quality comparison, for sure. I see it because, to me, it makes sense that this movie has such a larger production value. There is so much more you have to juggle. At it's, that point. And there's and there's IP. There's it's yes. it, this is a Hellraiser reboot. You have to make a Hellraiser movie. Whereas the Night House, as far as I know, is an original untethered. concept, untethered to source material, is an original screenplay. Minimal sex. Trying its own thing. And it's like, here Minimal you go, cast. we're giving the same people this this IP that has decades of legacy, and it's like make a and modern, make a modern new Hellraiser reboot. How do you do that justice? Production wise, what's the craziest thing they do in the Night House? There's some shifting banisters. There's some like plays with projection. Mm-hmm. Like there's a bit of a CG ghost. That's about it, right? There's a lot of thought that goes into the Night House. There's not necessarily a lot of money that went into the Night House. Whereas and and it's perfect for it. Well, like, there's a, there's a lot anything. of there's a lot of clever yeah. filmmaking but, in the Night House. There's right, and there is clever filmmaking in, in this movie too. Sure, but, sure. But there's also like again, like you're having to juggle like much larger production teams. Like look at look at the number of like 2D artists who worked on this movie. For instance, like we were looking at the credits right as they were scrolling. There was a full a full paragraph, paragraph yeah, devoted to names dozens of 2d, of 2D artists, artists which means which means they were juggling like teams of concept artists production designers uh artists like doing the props y- you name it and then on top of that there's all the, the cg teams there's like and of course like the practical teams alone like it is a massive ass because too like practically this movie had a lot more going on than the original hellraiser like yeah, when it comes yeah. to, like scale and scope yeah and totally teams. and at the end of the day, like they're they're two people, like they're they're two. It's a director and a writer, and the amount that you have to thread that narrative to those tasks is staggering. 
And and again, that goes for any production. That goes for yeah, any but movie. That the, goes for the, whatever. The script comes before everything else. Yeah, you know what true. I mean? And, and I and I don't yeah. think this movie has a great script. I think that's that's it's I, that, it's yeah, biggest it's like biggest failing. Yeah. The is ideas the script, are great. Yeah. But, but the the dialogue really. Yeah. The the problem is not with the par is not with the paragraph of two D artists that they hired for this. Like, no, that was a great. That goal. that shit paid off. Everything visually in this film, the design of the Cenobites the setting the exposition journal she finds like all of this looks fantastic all of that shit 100 percent paid off it's lacking in the script the See, script is where is where it fails i'll even go as far as saying like this is a mediocre script that's excellently made yeah like, yeah i agree with you all of the i'll agree with you visual elements of it and the visual storytelling of it are excellent the script itself could have used a couple more drafts is yeah to say the least you know i think it just had structural problems that it couldn't overcome ultimately yeah it was it was just it was just missing it was just missing that hellraiser horniness yeah so yeah at the end of the day it's like more fucking for sure and like more it doesn't even have it doesn't even have to be outright right, yeah it doesn't even have to be outright debauchery sex, but it does it needs to feel kinkiness. it needs to feel more yeah it needs to feel kinkier it needs yeah. to feel more perverted it needs to feel sleazy like there there's a number of sex scenes in the original but also just like frank is such like a gross yeah. sleazy well, nasty motherfucker like, you yeah, know like, like that really wretched like bit where like he's wearing her father's skin and he says come to daddy yeah to the her, whole the know? whole come to daddy thing like, yeah, it's, yeah. It is deeply sleazy and i uh it's sweaty too everybody's fucking wet moist. and moist that's <laughs> that I, I brought that up i don't remember on what episode not too long ago but that that's a fucking problem with movies today in comparison to films of the 80s and 90s movies used to be sweatier you know what yeah, i mean like this sounds dry. this sounds like a bit but i'm being dead serious <laughs> i'm being dead fucking serious in movies like hellraiser and predator and these movies like they feel like they exist in the real world like these characters are constantly dripping sweat they're exerting themselves they're hot they're stressed they're dirty they're uncomfortable and movies these days like everybody's like so clean even when they're cut and bleeding it looks like they're wearing it it, it looks like the makeup that it is you know what i mean like Movies are too dry these days. Movies need to be sweatier. Yeah. People need to be sweatier in movies. Bring back bring back sweaty movies. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think um I think you're right, bring back sweaty movies. But hey, the day I'm not gonna hit this movie too hard just because it did it did bring back some kick ass practicals. It did. And at, at the end really of the day, great. That, that is so much of what I want. In the, the 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 British say, when the British girl gets caught by the Cenobites and she's hung up on the chains and Pinhead pulls the pin out of their head just like so way longer good. than it should be and like <laughs> stabs it through her throat and we get the, the shot, shot. Oh, inside yeah, inside so of good. her Let's throat of yeah, the man. of the pin Holy going shit. in. Holy fuck, man. That whole sequence, we already talked about it a little bit, but that whole <laughs> sequence from the van extending into the hallway and the Cenobites appearing and the chains come out and holding her upright and Pinhead pulling out, slowly pulling out the pin. I like she looks back down, chatters like between her legs too. Like it's, ooh, scary. Yeah, oh man, it, that, that, all of that shit is so fucking good. Yeah. It's so good. I we haven't talked uh, much about the the billionaire guy who is has been living in the house the whole time because the first time he got his audience with Leviathan, he wanted sensation or whatever. So they put this weird fucking contraption like through his chest that like pulls on his nerves. <laughs> yeah. At first, I I was like, 
I don't know how I feel about this. And then they showed the detail of the nerves. And it's awesome. And then I was yeah, like, Yeah, okay, like running through dope. it. And that's then dope. like, and, and more, when, they, when they summon Leviathan again, and he uh, asks for the, the, the gift of power, the Leviathan configuration, and the the contraption like falls out. All the and we get that goo and gears and blood. Oh my God. Yeah, just it like- so good. The, the whole sequence of like the, the huge hole that- that goes through his chest like knitting itself back together like a good chunk of that was done practically and that felt like it was really capturing the to a lesser degree the 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 resurrection of frank in the original where yeah. like the body is kind of coming back together and nerves and muscles are joining and knitting you know, back into into one piece. And man, that shit was all so good. It looks so good. It's like, the movie fucking excels when it's doing these things. Excels. Yeah. And it has a decent amount of it, too. Again. You just, nine. you gotta, you gotta get through the first, like, hour and 15 minutes of the movie. You know, you gotta get through that first fucking... 70 minutes 70 yeah. minutes of the damn movie before it really starts kicking into gear and that's that's just like the biggest condemnation i can give this movie is like when it's on it's so fucking on but it makes you wait so long for it, it makes you wait so long for it i thought and then we can wrap up but i thought the the very end the sequence of the billionaire guy after he gets sucked up into Leviathan, him becoming a Cenobite was cool. All that stuff at the end. Awesome. The, yeah. like, the I thought camera, that was sick. The camera pulling back and we seeing that the house has been transported to like the labyrinth realm. Yeah. Great. The, everything to do with the house, fucking cool. The sets, the, the cage around it, the way that like he has that giant skylight and Leviathan like comes like, down comes it, down yeah. and like when it like is in perfectly it's perfectly in position it matches the square like cut into the ceiling mm -hmm. because he's like he's set all of his measurements perfect to keep the cenobites in or out like it, it's so fucking cool that like he turned his house into a lament configuration and frankly like is in the spirit of the rest of the franchise good or bad like too yeah. because like even like what is it hellraiser 4 like it has like the spaceship that turns out to be like that turns it turned to a like, giant it, they kind of did the same thing <laughs> yeah. but scaled it down but did it cool and i have a lot of respect for that like it, it looks great yeah. um lean into all of that shit more, more get rid yeah. of the rest of the generic bullshit exactly and uh and and honestly just cut it you don't even need to replace it but yeah him else. him becoming a cenobite at the end was really cool and like this sort of like all white sort of like tessellating like heavenly environment and he's sort of like crucified on like this golden yeah. altar it's like some of the final stages as it's Eternal. like yeah, it as great. like all of his skin is being stripped off in places and pins are being inserted and we see his eyes go black and all of that i'm assuming he's going to be the villain in the sequel if we get one I don't know how well this movie did. I, I hope it, you know, I, I hope it does well enough to do a sequel. Maybe even bring someone else it's on. It's hard to, to judge it. when it when it's not on Hulu, yeah, you yeah. know? Well, I mean, yes and no. And I guess, you know, I guess we have predictions for this we can talk about after we rate. But, like, Prey was, like opening like the first weekend it dropped was like very quickly the most streamed thing on hulu we didn't get that ever. story for hellraiser we did not get that story for hellraiser and i i think for good reason um do y'all want to rate this and then we yeah. can talk about our predictions uh when when y'all can go first i'm kind of oscillating no I, well you know i'm also oscillating is it 3.5 or 4 or a <laughs> no, no, it's lower for me. Yeah, but uh, where, but where are you at? I, I, I think going up to four would be wild. But you, I, you, I, you do I, you. I, just, I really, I mean, you know me. Like, what I really care about is like practicals and visuals, and this movie has it in in great amounts. Like, there's so many great sequences. But think, but think about the ratio. Yeah. But think about the ratio yeah, think of, of that, that to everything else. Before, think about the ratio. Yeah, I yeah, uh, three point five. Okay. In that case, like I just, I I really I really really liked the good, 
but I also was pretty fucking bored by the bad. And and again, too, I think with those characters, if you just made like you could just make them more compelling, like yeah. bring a little bit more to them, and you know, again, just trim them down so they're not on screen as long. So I'm not like wishing that they would get off of the screen so I could see more anything else. It would have been great. It would have been fucking awesome. Like, and again, just on the chopping block, I think you could just cut this movie down with with the not even with like additional shots, like just with the, the with, were available with from the what scenes, exists. Just yeah, with this cut of the movie, you could trim it down. Where you at, Ben? Yeah, like I said before, I feel like this is a mediocre script executed excellently. I think this movie could have been a tight 90 and great like you were saying cleve like i think there are some structural problems and i think it's one of those cases where the b plot of the billionaire is much more interesting than the a plot but despite that great creature effects really inventive practicals awesome stuff i'm gonna give it a strong three out of five I'm leaning between three and three and a half, but I'm going three. Uh, definitely worth seeing, and probably the best Hellraiser since two. Yeah. So, worth a watch. E- I mean, easily had the best Hellraiser since two, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's a pretty low bar. Um, yeah, I, I've, I, was, I was oscillating between two and a half and three because... Like y'all have said, like when it's on, it's really fucking on. Like the good stuff, I really, really love. But man, the bad stuff, I really hate. And I think there's more of the bad stuff than the good stuff. That being said, the sheer quality of the good stuff does give it a little bit of leg up. I think you summed it up perfectly, Ben, that it's a mediocre script executed excellently. And I think for that, I'm gonna give it the three. Yeah. I'm on the edge, but I'm gonna give I'm gonna give it the little bit of leg up and give it three out of five instead of two and a half. Yeah. Um, the tricky thing about it is, sorry, I just I just thought of this, but if I was to watch it again, I'd want to a watch it with someone else and be probably be doing something else for a little while and then stop and look at it during the cool like cinema. yeah it's it's absolutely but I just wouldn't want to like sit down and watch this movie again it's abs it's absolutely a scroll through your phone for the first hour of the movie and you <laughs> truly will not miss anything yeah. but whenever but whenever the cinebites show up you put your phone down like yeah. and that's that's really the prime way to watch this movie and that's not how I advocate watching most <laughs> movies yeah. but I do think it's the best way to experience Bummer. this because I, 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 really I, I do the i do think true. i do think the good things about this movie are worth are worth it are worth sure. experiencing yeah, but it doesn't it I'd doesn't change it. it doesn't change the fact that it's a slog i would recommend it with major caveats um but anyway that'll give hellraiser 2022 an average of 3.2 out of 5 um it is on hulu so if you haven't seen it at this point and you're intrigued check it out give it a go i guess yeah. all right so predictions time so i'll start off with ron tomatoes i predicted 78 for ron tomatoes uh tc predicted 72 Hmm. Cleve, you predicted 66. Right now, it's sitting at 67. Oh! Yo! Very close. Very, nice. very close. Wow. Good one, Cleve. Um, in terms of My collective number. rating, uh, I predicted 3.2, TCU predicted 3.8, and Cleve, you predicted 4. Well, you nailed so it. Spot I on. <laughs> lowballed it, yeah. And, and, you, and you nailed it. 3.2 it was. And uh, obviously, we don't have box office for this one since it did not get a theatrical release. Uh, but yeah, uh, what's next week? Is it what I think it is? Uh, let me the verify. best movie of 2022. Is it the Monsters? Is it? I think it might. Be is the it my favorite film of the, the year? Is it the masterpiece that is Robert Zombies? Robert Zombert. The Monsters. Mr. Uh, Zomberg Because I've seen it. And no, I... no, 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 no. Oh, it's it? not ah. the monsters oh, yet. We'll, stay tuned. We're doing Wendell and Wild. Oh, uh, that's next. coming out. Yeah. Okay. The so. new uh, Henry Selleck movie, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I, I believe 
as of the release of this episode, it is already out. Okay. So, uh, if you're interested, check it out and then it's a, listen to our episode it, next week. It's a Netflix thing, right? Yes. Henry Selick directed, Jordan Peele written yeah. or just produced. He's. I know. His, I know he's, he's in, it. in it. I know uh, he. It, I know Keen he wrote Peele, it too. He but wrote he also it. read it. Yeah. Okay. Keenan Michael Key was one of the characters. Yeah, Keen Keen Peel, I think, yeah, are are the the prote- are when are the the eponymous Wendell and Wild. Wow. Um so yeah, we're we're doing a kid we're doing a kids movie next week. Yep. Right, and then I I guess we're doing another one after that with the monsters. How about Yeah, it? spoiler alert for two weeks from now. Kids movies. Kids movies two weeks in a row. Anyway, uh <laughs> Sponsor time. Yeah. The sponsor shelf has made itself extra known this week. Thunk. By thunking extra loud if you even left that in. Which <laughs> might be audio poison, I don't know. Oh, probably will. Whatever. Yeah, whatever. All right. Here we go. This week, the pod people brought to you by Ben opening his drink. <laughs> um, uh, actually, no. This episode is brought to you by... Mm, that time you got really drunk and ordered pizza and then passed out before the delivery driver got there. So you woke up, no pizza. That happened to me once. That's a true story. Damn, it's almost like you wrote this, but you didn't. The sponsor nope, shelf did. the sponsor shelf did. Wild. But yeah. The sponsor shelf must, must have channeled... Pretty universal. Must have channeled that from my brain. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you do sleep next to the sponsor shelf. I, yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah. And it you does do have, infect, like, weird marks on your temples, so... It does infect my dreams. Yeah, assumedly, it, it lets out its tendrils at night. I think it sucks me off, too. <laughs> <laughs> that would explain a lot. I have such wow. sights of pain and pleasure. And sponsor. To such, such sights to suck me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the end of that sponsor this week. <laughs> and that'll bring us to the end of this week's episode. Is it the end of us? Stay tuned. <laughs> Stay tuned if you like. If you like the show, what you're gonna get sucked to death by the sponsor show? Maybe. Stay tuned. Yeah, stay tuned to find out. <laughs> if you week. like, if you like the show, leave us a five star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. You can support us on Patreon at patreoncom slash pod. Shout out to our honorary pod boys, Sam Simon and Zach Confer. Y'all are the best. Uh, what did y'all think about Hellraiser? Let us know. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at PodPeoplePod and at Letterboxd.com slash PodPeoplePod where you'll find a list of all the films we've talked about on the show with our average ratings and links to those reviews. I'm on Twitter at some spooky snake. If you uh, want me to get sucked off by the sponsor shelf, you can follow me at twi- on Twitter at uh, Mr. Sheets. And uh, if you go to DreadXP.com, you'll see all the super cool games that they're working on, of which I have had a hand in, in some capacity, whether it's art or QA or whatever else. But uh, yeah, go go check that out. Most recently, you can check out I Doesn't Exist, or you can go wishlist that, which is a really spooky point in, or uh, spooky text-based adventure. I, I think it's gonna, it, it's so fucking cool. Or you can check out Amanda the Adventurer, our spooky analog horror dora the explorer game i don't know if i could say that actually just analog horror children's game analog dora explorer horror horror dora <laughs> explorer horror analog it's scary freestyle spin right now freestyle <laughs> that's it that's what i got this week well thanks for listening and until next time just remember pain pleasure whatever it's all the same right <laughs>